So when you think about that high school student who cannot um, name a teacher that is a favorite teacher, they're lacking what you described. Um, and there's a difference we've been discussing as a group between an adult who's a caring role model, you know, someone who may be um, attentive, a good listener, and actually somebody who can care for you not only as the person who you are, but also as an intellectual and as somebody who's developing a set of skills, a set of lenses through which to think, and, um, and to press and push you through challenging, high expectations um, that at the, at the end of the day will help you to grow and um, become a more fulfilled individual and contributor to society. So thank you for taking that moment to reflect on that. And I'll turn now to our panelists to talk a little bit more about um, what their connection to teaching is and what brings them here today. Well, first to explain that Connections Education operates Connections Academy schools, which are primarily public schools, but we call them virtual schools because these are students who generally are outside of a traditional classroom. They might be at a home or some other location. And so often people look at us a little bit like, well, what do your teachers do? I mean, why would I be here talking about teachers if these are online? Well, our teachers are very engaged, and we're obviously going to talk a little bit more about our teacher model because we think we're doing some very interesting work around teacher effectiveness, and we are also beginning to move into traditional classroom environments in sort of a hybrid setting. I also want to mention that my mother was a teacher, fifth grade, and uh, I noticed that was a theme through many of our panelists, but I had one challenging event, which was my school was so small, I had my mother as my fifth grade <laughs> teacher. And let me just tell you, when you want to talk about demanding, um, it was a very interesting experience, but she's been a great inspiration to me. I'm very happy to be here to talk about teaching. Thank you. Andrew? Um, well, I've never been a teacher. I guess my closest experience of teaching was I coached uh, my son's rugby team for about 10 years with very mixed uh, results, actually. Um, <laughs> so I know it can be difficult. Um, but. For us, our organization, um, as uh, Jeanette's already mentioned, we have uh, our own private schools around the world uh, in China, Middle East, and Europe. And we also run school improvement programs for governments around the world in the UK, Middle East, uh, and in Asia, and uh, employ something like 2,000 teachers. So unless the teachers in our organization are engaged and successful, uh, then we're going to fail as an organization. So, it's absolutely uh, imperative for us that uh, our teachers uh, are effective and, and, and doing a fantastic job because that's what helps us to, to thrive. Thank you. Kelly? Uh, for me, I really had no intention initially of going into teaching. My parents had wanted me to be a lawyer, and that was the path that I was on. Uh, and had my LSAT taken, had my applications ready to go, and my senior year of college at UC San Diego volunteered at a brand new charter school that had just been established. Uh, it was on campus, and there were two requirements to be accepted for the students. You had to live below the poverty line, and you, need to you needed to come from a family where neither parent had attended or graduated from college. Uh, and so I started tutoring in a seventh grade advisory classroom and an eighth grade US history classroom and saw the incredible uh, nature of this school and the transformative work that a teacher can do uh, and realized that if I wanted to have an immediate and very important impact on the future of our country and the future of our society, um, that it was through teaching that I could do this most effectively. And so I went on to Stanford, um, received my credential and master's and then went back uh, to teach at the preschool UCSD where I am now uh, and just really feel incredibly blessed to be able to work with the students that I work with and see lives tran transformed on a daily basis. Thank you. I've been involved with teachers and teaching at all levels for more than 50 years, which can only be said by someone who has grown old ever so gracefully. <laughs> uh, I feel myself in the, in the presence of royalty since Kelly is not only the 2010 California Teacher of the Year, but one of the four finalists for the United States Teacher of the Year. And if you don't think... <laughs> you know, royal families get to be who they are by descent. This is hard work. Uh, in any event, uh, part of what's been important for me over all those years has been engaging concurrently with the study of teaching and teachers 
and especially the study of how people learn to be physicians. And at one point, I had a joint appointment in education and medicine. And I still remember the moment we were then working on developing a national assessment that became the emergency medicine credentialing test. So all emergency physicians uh, who are board certified are certified by the uh, assessment that we designed in the mid-70s. And I was observing in an emergency room trying to figure out what we ought to be testing and what we ought to be designing. And I remember the moment I realized that over the years I had studied people doing medicine, an emergency room during some sort of disaster was the closest I ever saw the practice of medicine approach the complexity of an average day in Kelly's life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yet, we as a society somehow didn't get it. Uh, how extraordinarily difficult, demanding this profession is. And yet in medicine, we give them thousands of hours of training. We phase in their entry into the profession. They don't get to do it right away. They go through internships and residencies and fellowships. And with our teachers, we give them so much less training. And then we toss them into the lion's den on day one. And that was an epiphany. Thank you. And my own personal connection to teaching is um, when I was in fourth grade, I taught my first class to kindergartners. And um, after that, and a couple of um, sort of journeys to other ideas about what I would do for my future, um, was uh, volunteering at East Palo Alto Elementary School while a freshman here at, at Stanford. And one of the children said, will you please be my teacher? Because she didn't have one um, that cared about her or would um, ask of her what she needed. So from that very moment, I said, yes, I'll be your teacher because the need is so great. Um, and I had had such a privilege myself of excellent teachers in the public system, a mother who was also a teacher and currently is a teacher. Um, and it is, as, as Lee mentioned, and as Kelly knows in the day to day, one of the most demanding, most rewarding um, callings there is. So um, I'm very glad to be here and um, to share some thoughts and ideas in what is, um, as Carlos has, you know, brought us together to think about, in some ways, a potential inflection point in the field um, as we continue with millions of students worldwide and millions of teachers worldwide. So, thank you. Um, first question that I want to pose is, um, you know, the, the 21st century and the lingo of the 21st century is putting more and different demands on students as learners. And we've heard um, statistics that are pretty stunning about what kinds of jobs are requiring knowledge-based um, backgrounds for students. 123 million, I think, was what um, Mike mentioned yesterday, with approximately 50 million available now within the United States to fulfill those. So when we think about the 21st century and student learning needs and demands, what comes to mind to you? What, what is it that students as learners need and demand from us? Well, we've heard a lot of talk about the need for critical thinking skills, also collaboration, being able to work not just one-on-one -on -one, but as a group. And one of the things that I guess, um, it'll be slightly off topic, but hopefully we'll come back to it, which is we're thinking a lot about issues around academic integrity because particularly as a program that's online, that's something we have to be thoughtful about. And an example was given yesterday of a student who had a device in the classroom and was actually searching for information and sort of being told to put that away. <laughs> So in many respects, though, isn't that what we want kids to do? In other words, rather than just sort of wrote, recite facts back to us, do you really need to know the exact date that battle took place, or do you need to be able to find information about it, but more importantly, to understand what that battle did in the context of the overall war, and then why did the war actually happen in the first place? Isn't that really what we're about? And yet most of our teaching is still really based more on just rote feedback of information. So we want to figure out a way to really make 
make that student be able to take advantage of all the tools that we have and then make good decisions based on them as opposed to coming up with, I think, the more traditional view of just being able to recite the facts back. And I think for me, when I'm designing lessons for my students, is I don't think about teaching them necessarily just a set of information. I think about presenting them with a set of experiences. And really what I'm trying to create are students who are creative and who are able to participate in divergent thinking. So do they have ideas that have value? Can they explain those? Can they analyze multiple perspectives? Uh, and then make their own analysis and understanding based off of the information that they have. Are they being given authentic and worthy learning experiences that allow them to really innovate, to create, to explore and hopefully to be curious individuals who go on to um, really have ideas that are going to push our country and our, our nation and our world to that next level. Mm -hmm. well, we think about um, creating 21st century learners in, in our schools and one of the benefits we have of being uh, international and, and, and global is that uh, we can share experiences across schools. Uh, and we have this concept that we call the global classroom. Um, what we try and do is make sure that students in Shanghai are able to work with our students in Warsaw or our students maybe in um, Villars in, in the Swiss Alps can work with our students in Bratislava and that they can cooperate on learning. Uh, maybe we can do some student exchanges uh, which we've had going on. We use technology a lot, a lot of uh, uh, online learning also sharing experiences amongst our teachers online of, of teaching in these, these different environments and, and really trying to create this uh, concept of, of 21st century learners who are, are learning in a global classroom, which we think is preparing them best for what they're going to face. Because I think you know, that the world is going to be a, a dramatically different place in, in the next 10, 20, 30 years to even the pace of change that we see now. Mm -hmm. Did you want to well, I. I too can, can describe the intellectual skills, but I'm, I'm struck by the extent to which my colleagues on the panel also talked about integrity, collaborative skills, going beyond the text. My greatest concern is what are we doing to prepare kids uh, to be active and productive members of a democratic society? Uh, the miracle of this country is not Silicon Valley. The miracle of this country, as Robert Putnam recently noted about religion, is that we are the most, well, let's take religion, the most religious country in the world. More Americans are engaged in religious practice than in any other country in the world, including Iran. And yet we are also the most religiously diverse country in the world, and we're the most religiously tolerant country in the world. We don't burn each other's houses of worship. We don't kill each other because one of our kids married out of the faith. There is an enormous amount of mixing and interacting, and that's what makes this democracy work much more than it doesn't. That's the toughest achievement for the 21st century. The world is a world that's getting more and more tribal, and I think we're pretty good at helping people learn to be both tribal and inclusively pluralistic. And I think public schools and the best of our independent schools are very good at that. If we screw that up, it doesn't matter how many more Silicon Valleys we create, we will cease being a great democracy, and that will be a failure of our education. And I know that um, you know, not just among us, but across the nation, there's been a, a little bit of a tension between preparing young people for the kinds of interactions and thinking tasks that you've described and that are present in your communities of learning with some of the basic skills arguments that people have to um, say, well, we just need a baseline. So what do we do about um, reconciling the demands to have a set of basic skills that some people say is the foundation of this democracy that Lee, you know, Lee points out, um, while others are, you know, are, are not as concerned with bridging and taking that to a, a greater degree and, a, and, and, and even thinking about what we assess and what we value in those assessments as a measure along the continuum of whether we're asking kids for just the minimum or whether we're actually asking greater of them. Can you comment on that, one or two of you? Well, I'll um, have a go at it in terms of, I, I, I haven't got any experience of the American system. 
uh, directly, but we have experience of some pretty diverse systems around the world. You know, Saudi Arabia, we're working in schools in Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, um, China, uh, Malaysia. Uh, and I think the challenges that you face as a teacher in, in each of those environments is, is completely different to perhaps one that you've been used to facing in your home country. So we're typically taking teachers out of places like the UK and, and you know, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and then bringing them to these countries and, and trying to help them to, uh, to uh, move schools forward. And what the, often uh, working for the state, you know, often working for the government, what the government wants, uh, I find, it is often at odds to what the teacher thinks that the student needs. Uh, and so the, you know, the government in Abu Dhabi will create 110 key performance indicators by which they're going to measure the progress that we've made helping school improvement in, in Abu Dhabi in the state school system. Whereas our teachers are bringing sort of a, a much richer uh, knowledge of, of teaching and learning from around the world uh, to the school and, and they want to do far more than just kind of take that baseline and you know make sure that when it comes to the assessment at the end of the year that the child's done a bit better in their English test. So I think for us you know it, it's part of it is making sure that you let the teachers free um, to do what you know what they do best, which is you know creating a fantastic learning environment and and moving all of the students forward as far as they can, rather than being restricted uh, solely to a series of you know baseline targets that they've got to incrementally improve by the end of the year. Anybody else? I would also just add that I think that. A lot of times there is a misalignment between what it is that we are trying to uh, have our students become, so the skills and the dispositions that we want in our students and then the way that we are assessing that. So absolutely, I think that it is imperative that if I am preparing my students to be um, global citizens and participants in our democratic society that they need to know how to read, they need to know how to write, they need to know basic math skills. But then there is so much more on top of that that they need to then be able to do when once they have those base skills. And so it's finding measures of assessment that not only are going to ensure that every child is being given access to a quality education that teaches them those basics, but that we're moving beyond that. And I think that's my fear when we look at the achievement gap is that I don't want students that just know the basics. I want students that know how to think critically, how to collaborate, how to recognize and understand their role in our democratic process so that we can protect what it is that is so fantastic about uh, this country. Okay. All right. Um, so yesterday, um, among the speakers and among the public out there, um, there's been some suggestions that the amount of money that's been spent in professional development um, and capacity building for teachers has been a waste. That we've, you know, since the nation at risk have doubled our investments and gotten no increase in results. And yet we know that um, teachers are critical for the success of students' development along a host of measures. So what is it um, that we, as, that you as a panel, can reflect on and think about of the kinds of investments that do have good payoff and the kinds of learning um, and, and advancement of, of teaching for these goals around student outcomes that um, you've come to know? Well, if I could first just uh, comment again about what I think has been so wasteful, and that is the idea that for uh, obtaining additional credits, a teacher gets automatically paid, not only reimbursed for the course, but generally moves up in some type of step fashion on a very mechanical uh, salary scale. And I have to say that I think that schools of education, and I'm sure this is not true here at Stanford, but many schools of education have been hugely complicit in this because it is a huge revenue stream for them as they get all these teachers continually taking additional credits, not only to maintain their certification, but also to move up the salary scales. And I think many of these courses are sort of the equivalent of basket weaving. The idea is that they're low cost to deliver. They're, they're generally pretty easy because frankly, busy teachers are, you know, have lots of other things to do. So they don't want a really tough, rigorous course. And everybody gets very happy because the teacher gets more money, the School of Education gets more money, and the only students or the only people that don't benefit are the students in the school. 
So what we believe is that we need much more targeted professional development that school systems are also doing uh, that is associated with the direct problems of classroom management that are particularly around this data-driven instructional model. And I'm sure we're gonna talk more about that, but let's just say it is a fundamental shift in the attitude of a teacher, which is I'm, my job is to deliver instruction to you. It's your job to learn it or not learn it. And if it fails to be you know, sort of sunk in, it's your fault, not mine, to my job is actually to move you from here to there. And so any professional development that is around that we think is a good investment. And most of the professional development, particularly those that just drive step functions and salary increases, we think has been a very poor use of resources. Yeah, this is a big problem, Jeanette, because I'm increasingly persuaded that we're going about this whole, uh, uh, this whole strategy of improving the quality of teaching in the wrong way, and we've gotten worse by using now as the bottom line an utterly invalid and rather corrupting uh, use of value-added models in standardized student achievement testing. Uh, growing body of evidence that this is not a valid way to measure differences in individual teachers. And when you use other outside assessments against which you look at the validity of the standardized tests, you find again and again that when you make high stakes associated with these tests, kids' test scores go up, but they don't change on the outside assessments. Uh, Professional development, uh, I think that I agree with you about the targeting. And yet, uh, in the most recent studies of the very best professional development uh, model I've ever seen, which was looking at middle school mathematics, giving teachers intense two-year workshops in the middle school mathematics, and using tailored tests of the kids on the mathematics, they still didn't show the impact. And I think we just simply may need to totally re-examine and redesign professional development so that it gets much, much closer to the actual practice of the teachers and begins to be part of the process of teaching, examining how things are going, figuring out what isn't going well, learning how to do that better, staying much closer to practice, and not staying further away. And I think that, that may be the way to go. But professional development is our biggest problem. And I would say as a practicing teacher, um, and I have spoken at length with colleagues about this, that we have been to more than enough professional development opportunities off-site that simply haven't been worth it. Um, that what matters is what we're doing at our school site. So at our school, for instance, at Preuss, we have two hours every Friday of staff development. Uh, and we do a system, really, in which at the beginning of the year, we identify where are our needs, either within our department or within a grade level. Uh, and then we use a lesson study and an instructional rounds model in which we are in each other's classrooms. We are analyzing student work. We are using our standardized test scores as a base. Um, but that actually tells me very little about what my my students are learning on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's about listening to the questions they're asking. It's about listening to the conversations they're having with one another and that they're having with me. It's about looking at their writing, analyzing the work and the products that they're producing, sitting together and collaborating with a group of faculty and administrators around this work, redesigning it to make it better, and then going back and reteaching it. Uh, and I have to say that that's what was so fantastic about going through the STEP program here is I started out way ahead of colleagues who had gone through other programs because that was the model that we did here, um, where we were in classrooms learning the theory, but we were marrying it to the practical application that we were doing on a day-to-day -day basis in the classrooms where we were student teaching. Um, and for me, that's where the growth happens. Mm -hmm. Well, and I know that um, one of the panelists yesterday um, from McKinsey was describing that different systems that show extraordinary growth um, apply different ways of supporting professional learning at different stages of growth. So when you're going from uh, poor to fair or fair to good, a good to great, a great to excellent, you are doing different things along that continuum and spectrum because the demands 
are different and the needs are different. So when Kelly is at the Preuss School describing some of the professional investments that you and others are making in your learning of your students' growth and, and learning, um, there's a bunch of assumptions that are met um, because of the caliber of professionals that you are as a community, of the background and learning that you've already done heretofore, and where you are you know, in the evolutionary sort of trajectory. Um, and that's not the case where um, every school has that. And so I'm curious about, you know, what do we do when we have such um, different um, demands for, you know, different professional development needs, not only to a person, but to a system. What can we do to um, revamp, as Lee described, you know, professional development that honors both what people know and recognizes what people need to know that will work? Well, we do, I, I give a, a slightly personal, maybe on dangerous ground, view of, of teachers now uh, because of not having been a teacher and having worked in a number of different industries. Okay, he's off the panel. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in my uh, experience, teachers are, are different um, as a group of people than the vast majority of people that, that I've worked with. And it's something to do with the fact that they've had a vocational calling. And unlike the vocational calling that doctors and lawyers have had, this vocational calling hasn't in later life paid them loads and loads of money. Um, so they're, they're people who have chosen to go down this route of teaching. So they feel passionate about wanting to do the best for students in, in their classroom. That, that's what they really care about. In my experience, they really care about CPD, about continuous professional development. It's very important to teachers. If you have a motivated workforce, if, if the employees in your organization are highly motivated, feel they're getting what they want, they're going to perform better. So I think, you know, intrinsically giving the teachers what they feel they need so that they feel they can perform better is very important because they're going to be happier about what they do. The thing that we find, we're forever surveying, surveying our parents, surveying our teachers. We do two big uh, surveys every year, and we talk a lot about professional development in the survey. And we, the feedback we get is, is the same as, as, um, as Kelly has, has described, which is the professional development they value most highly is the professional development they do at the school with their colleagues. That's what they find uh, the most beneficial, that's where they learn most, that's the most practical, that's the things they feel that they can, they can do most with. So for me, um, professional development, I was very surprised to hear the comments about professional development uh, yesterday uh, coming from, from the uh, stage because it's something that as a, you know, we don't do well, we don't get more students, we're gonna go out of business, we're, not, we're either not gonna have full schools because we have gotta compete, or governments aren't gonna give us contracts. We're spending more on professional development than we've ever, spelt, uh, mm -hmm. ever spent. We, we think it's an absolute driver for making sure our schools are better. Mm -hmm. Well, Lee may have some, some comment too in terms of comparing the development of professions in contrast in comparison to the, the development of teachers as far as, you know, when we train doctors and we train lawyers, we don't ask them what they think they need all the time. We have a body of knowledge that suggests a pretty tried and true way of doing things. Um, and yet, it's, it's also a profession of um, hypothesis building, testing, and you know, tweaking. So what, what are some of the lessons that you've learned from other uh, professions that apply to this question around professional development of teaching? Well, I think one of the lessons is that when it's quite clear that the practitioner is the key element in the success of the enterprise, and there doesn't seem to be much doubt about that being the teacher, that if you have not yet figured out how optimally to do professional development, you don't get out of the business. Uh, there are forms of cancer where after 50 years of research, we have the same mortality rates we had before. The answer is, We'll never make any money doing this kind of research. Let's get out of the business. But rather, let's redouble our efforts to find a way to do it. Uh, the teaching hospital is the best form of professional development. I know it sounds very much, very much like Kelly's description of Preuss and your accounts of what you do with your own teachers. The continuing professional development of the physicians is absolutely embedded in the daily rounds and rotations and quality assurance meetings of the professional staff. And as new people flow in and out, they learn that set of ways of doing work. 
Uh, it means that you devote resources away from the patients to the continued development of the teachers if it's a zero-sum game on the assumption that over time it will redound to the benefit of both. And we have to be prepared to take that kind of approach. Otherwise, we'll keep on getting empty credits with empty graduate degrees instead of building expertise. And just to confirm, that's very much the approach that we take. We do a great deal of very targeted work that is much more around what's actually happening at the school level. We also create learning communities across our schools where uh, there's actually teachers who get together who are math teachers, science teachers, who focus on the curriculum and what's working, what's not working. So again, I think it's this issue. It, it, I almost wish there was a new word that we came up with it because people have this idea in their head of professional development, which is this, you know, you go off site or somebody comes right. in and it's just sort of this rote lecture as opposed to this very much of an engaged, continuous improvement and actually setting time, important time aside to make sure that happens. And we just confirm that's what's really worked for us too. And there's been in the parlance of public debate in the United States a real um, frame of thinking where if we just got rid of the the worst teachers, whether it's 10% or 25%, um, then we would advance student outcomes by whatever percent. Um, and if you have three million teachers in the United States, and I don't know what the worldwide number is, um, if, if, you, if you take the 10% out, and let's assume that you have fair processes through which to do that, um, do you have sort of the pipeline to um, ensure that you've got enough teachers who are going to do a good enough job or that um, or that you and, and, I, and they, I think the answer is you there, there just aren't enough people that are going to fill those seats currently with spectacular um, credentials that will do the kind of work that's necessary and so this investment in the current teachers that we have with some attention to you know, addressing people who are incompetent and not worthy of growth, uh, or not not demonstrating growth, not 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 that they're not worthy, um, presents an interesting and, and challenging dilemma for us. So when I think about how you know we recruit teachers, there's been a lot of criticism in the um, in the United States about how we recruit teachers and the lack of standards that we hold um, compared to other countries that are advancing their work um, exponentially. What what are some of the things that you think we need to do to to recruit and retain um, teachers that we can then continue to invest in in the ways that you described earlier on professional development? I think the, you know, some of the uh, talk uh, yesterday was around places like South Korea, and, and mm -hmm. I've actually, um, we, we uh, had a school in, in South Korea. Uh, and the thing that makes the difference in South Korea, and they were talking about the, um, you know, the teachers being from the, the top 33% of the uh, graduate uh, cohort. I think it's, it's the way that education is thought of uh, in these places as opposed to, I, I can't use the, the US as an example, I can use the UK as an example, and, and education is just not as highly valued uh, in the UK as it is in Southeast Asia. Now, that may be because Southeast Asia knows that they need to invest in human capital above the UK and the, the US in order to catch up, but for whatever reason, uh, and there are many um, social and economic factors driving it, education is valued more highly in these places. So that means parents value it more highly, that means that students value it more highly, and that means that for the teachers to come in, they're going to be feeling like they're going to be doing a, a job that's right at the top of society, so that the teacher in Korea is an absolutely revered individual. You know, And the way that people think about teachers in Korea, we had to put teachers' CVs on our website, okay? So teacher CV, if we didn't have teacher CVs on our website, no one had come to the school. So the, the parents just demanded that the teachers were going to be fantastic. And there was an, a culture of mm -hmm. creating fantastic teachers in that country. So uh, it's an observation more than a solution. Mm -hmm. I think it's also imperative that we treat teachers like professionals, that uh, you know, out of the three million teachers in the United States, for instance, there may be 10% uh, that would be deemed poor quality, but that means there's 90% um, that are, are very good um, and are doing, you know, incredible work in their classrooms. Uh, and what I find so interesting about the, the teaching profession is that 
You go to conferences such as this one where there's a lot of talk about teaching, and yet there are no teachers. Uh, and you would never go to a medical conference or you would never go to a conference about law and not have lawyers or doctors that were present. And so I think it's so important that we include the teacher's voice in these conversations um, because simply good teachers aren't going to stay in the profession uh, if we don't feel that our voice is part of the conversation um, because we have something very, very important to add in that we are the daily practitioners. Um, we are doing the day-to-day -day research in our classrooms around what it takes to help students excel. Uh, and to get the best and the brightest, they have to know that they are entering a profession where they're going to be treated as much like a professional as if they were to enter medicine or to enter law, because that is what they're competing against. And I know for me, as someone who was on the law school track, what made the difference was working at a school and at a system that treated me like a professional and that really valued what I was bringing to the table. And I look at what I do every day as very much a partnership with my administration and my leadership, um, that we each bring such important elements to the table and both recognize that we cannot be successful without collaborating with the other. Um, and I'm not sure that I would have stayed in teaching as long had I been part of a system or a school that didn't value that input. Mm -hmm. I was, sorry. Well, I was just gonna say, I think it's ironic, uh, Jeanette, that you know, we're in a session here co-sponsored by Goldman Sachs, part of an industry that is generally ascribed responsibility for one of the worst global economic disasters the world has ever encountered, namely the economic uh, disaster we've just encountered. And I've never heard anybody suggest that it could have been avoided by simply getting rid of the bottom 10% of people working in banking. Uh, no, I... <laughs> The, I'm not denying that there are people who shouldn't be teaching. There are people who shouldn't be practicing law or medicine or banking and a lot of other professions shouldn't be parenting as well. Uh, uh, but the response has been there's something more systemic. It has to do with a culture of respect with a system of reward and recognition uh, that provides incentives for people to be prepared to commit their lives and, in some sense, the well-being of their children to a predictable economic trajectory personally that sometimes is scary uh, and with a, a, in a, in a profession where every year, if you're a public school teacher, you can get a pink slip telling you you're not going to have a job next year. I mean, there are a whole bunch of conditions there that simply have to be addressed or we will never get to where Singapore or South Korea or Shanghai is with regard to these kinds of, mm -hmm. of effects. Andrew? Well, I just want to say that uh, we're not a good one to address sort of problems with rec recruiting quality teachers because we have overwhelming demand for our positions. I would expect you have the same, and I wouldn't be surprised, Kelly, if at your school people are probably offer Kelly standing a job at the end of in this line <laughs> right, to get there. And, uh, I'll give him my card now in case I forget. <laughs> You talked to me first last night, later. Uh, but what I will tell you that's interesting is how many people we see then who are leaving traditional schools or who are who actually left teaching and would like to come back. In other words, it wasn't teaching that they left. If we had any other business, I think, that was losing 40, 50 percent of their people in the first five years, people would be sitting there going, what's fundamentally wrong with this, that we're losing valued employees? These are not people that you can easily train. You know, I mean, there's some where you want some turnover. Teaching is not one of them. And at least what we hear overwhelmingly is that they don't feel supported. They felt ill-prepared to be addressing what they were supposed to do, and then they didn't have the support to make them successful, whether it was classroom management or whether it was uh, parental engagement or whether it was resources within school. It didn't have this collaborative environment that Kelly describes. They were pretty much put in their classroom and they were told good luck. The other issue, of course, is that we have this system that says let's take the very youngest, least experienced teachers we have and put them with the absolute most challenging, worst kids. 
And then they wonder why these teachers are crying and literally out the door because they can't take it, as opposed to saying, shouldn't you be taking the teacher who's more highly paid? And frankly, one of the reasons they should be more highly paid is they actually have the skills to cope with some of these problems. So if we actually would address the things that are causing good teachers to leave, I think we would have fewer bad teachers. And the last comment is in our system, you can move up the ladder based on merit. In other words, we have very significant salary increases that you can go up as you become a lead teacher and a master teacher, which also involves then supervising other teachers, not just completely uh, teaching responsibilities. And it doesn't matter, frankly, you could be a three or four year teaching superstar and, and oversee teachers who have 10, 15 years experience. It's a meritocracy and many good teachers are really frustrated when they're in their classroom hour after hour after school and they watch their colleagues walk out the door as soon as the bell rings, they see their students not engaged and they, and they know in many cases they might be making way less than that individual with no path to change other than time. And we've got to change that system before we're gonna solve this problem. Yeah, the point I was gonna make, I, I think that there does have to be accountability performance management though and I think that you do have to remove bad teachers because the people that are going to resent you the most if you don't do that are the other teachers in that school because they know the people that aren't performing and, and if they are not being addressed if their bad performance isn't being addressed if you're allowing that as the people responsible for that organization to carry on then the other people that are doing a fantastic job which is the vast majority are going to look at you and say you're not performing your role in terms of managing this institution right. so i think it's very important that you do remove bad teachers right and i think both of these comments and others previous are are looking at teacher needs that are provided or ought to be provided through the system of um, leadership of information that people really need to make decisions um, about sort of managing and monitoring and, and developing. Um, and you know, you looked at examples of how the profession can do that from within with some objectivity and clear guidelines, um, but often those are sort of framed in perverse incentive structures, right, as opposed to um, ones that are honestly and, and genuinely building. So we want to um, take a moment to ask if there are questions from the audience to share with the panel. Yes, ma'am. It would be great to have the microphone. Yeah, there are two microphones and one walking over. I'm Giselle Huff with the Jacqueline Newman Foundation. This question is for uh, Kelly and Lee. Um, those of us who believe that the future of education lies in blended learning, think of uh, teaching as a bifurcated thing where content is delivered online in an adaptive, personalized way and the teacher takes on the role, the pedagogy is Socrates, where the teacher takes on the role of connecting the dots, of uh, deepening the knowledge of the kids that they've gained on the computer and um, making sure that they've gotten what they need to get, as you were describing, Kelly, that other element, and as you were saying, Lee, the, making children part of a democracy. I'd like to know how you feel about that. So her question, if you didn't hear it, was started off around blended learning. I'm not sure that came through. Um, and, and how you, you look at the distinction between those ways of learning. Well, I think that technology has an incredibly important role to play. Uh, I just think that it's very important that we look at technology and how we're integrating it in very purposeful ways. So what is our end objective and how are we using technology to get there? I also think that there are things that technology can't replace. Uh, technology can't replace the conversation that I have with my students around Federalist 10. Technology can't replace the conversation I have with my students around the 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause and how that applies to various issues in our society. So I absolutely think that technology has an important role and I use it in many different ways. Um, particularly, I use it a lot for collaborative forums. So we'll be having an in-class discussion about Federalist 10 or the 14th Amendment and that carries on at home through a online forum that I have facilitated where conversation continues between students and myself in a different setting. Uh, I think there's lots of ways technology can be used. I just want to make sure that we maintain the, the collaborative nature um, and the critical thinking that I think a teacher facilitates in very important ways. 
And I would simply add, I'm a strong advocate for what you call blended learning, but I want the blending to be much more interpenetrating. I don't really believe that you can deliver facts online and then have teachers begin to work with them Socratically or in dialogue, because that begins to convey to students the fallacy that facts have a certain independent existence all their own. The fact of Federalist 10 is not a fact until students begin to explore what it means and then go back and re-examine the text and see that what it said isn't what they thought it said. And this is true of the number four as well as Federalist 10. Numbers are not facts, they are opportunities. And so teachers can't just teach the facts and wait to do a dialogue with the students later on. So I want us to do blending, and if your foundation funds that, as a former <laughs> foundation president, bless you, uh, but fund it at a higher level. S raise, the, uh, raise the mark, set a higher standard for blending. Um, don't just let them have the ingredients sit side by side in the pantry. Thank you. Do we have another question? It's working. It's on now. It's very low, but it's on now. <laughs> and your name? Um, no, you're just very so, high. <laughs> <laughs> it's all a matter of perspective. It's not just fact. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, just take some of the things you've said al already and ask you to drill down a bit. And for me, these are ideas I, I work around. I'm Kevin Cloud from Alexander Dawson Foundation. These are ideas that I, I have playing around in my head regularly. So Cali, um, I lived in San Diego, so I know Preuss well, and High Tech High, which is also mm -hmm. in town, which is also very committed to the kind of professional development that you're talking about. And we all know uh, other institutions we, like, uh, well, Teach for America and KIPP, Preuss, High Tech High, these are institutions that are built upon the, the true believers. And I have this concern, um, you know, when I look at the true believer, well, I, I taught in the classroom, I work for a foundation now. You're teacher of the year, and my expectation is you're not necessarily going to be in the classroom for another three or four or five years because that's, I, I hire right now, you need to be careful sitting next to her. I have uh, Louis Chapelier, 2009. <laughs> He's working for me right now. We have a lovely summer program. You can continue at Preuss <laughs> and work in our summer program. All right, the job fair is after. The job fair is after. So what's your question? I just suggested the Stanford doctoral program. <laughs> so I, I just wonder about the idea of, of transferring that, the, these places of true believers, and moving that. Scaling. We keep talking about scaling at this conference. Scaling that. I don't, I, I don't see how we scale that. It's hard for me to see. And I want to link that back to this idea of the teaching hospital, you know, this model, because somewhere in, in this conversation, those two need to come together, and, and I, I don't quite see how we bring them together. I see the true believers. I find it hard to think about us capturing those true believers and that scaling. Um, I see the idea of the teaching hospital. My last thing is, it all seems to come down to changing culture, and I, th that's nice. Let's say it. Let's change the culture. How, how does that movement happen? Thank you for that. Let me mention question. one example, if I can, yeah. Jeanette, because I think the analogy is a good one. Um, hospitals have a record of one out of 20 patients that enter a hospital get an infection they didn't have when they went in. 100,000 people a year die from hospital-borne infections, and it costs our healthcare system 30 to 40 billion dollars a year. The solution was not to get rid of the 10 percent of the healthcare personnel who weren't true believers. The solution turns out to be introducing new norms into every hospital about hand washing about running central line catheters that involve checklists and discipline, but more than anything, creating a community of practice in which everybody feels responsible for everybody else's practice. And people wash their hands, and they follow these checklists, 
and in some cases, infection rates drop to zero. I, I think you're right that we can't, believe, we can't depend on everybody being motivated the way the teachers in a KIPP school apparently are, or the teachers at Preuss are, or the teachers in many ordinary public schools are, by the way, mm. as you know. Uh, but I think we can introduce systems that get people to participate in a community with new, better norms and change a lot of what makes that 10% so toxic. And I would say a big part of that, too, is the leadership, um, that I've had the opportunity to work with a number of, of schools, um, particularly in San Diego Unified, um, that were not performing well. And what made the difference was the leadership, was bringing in leadership that had a strong instructional practice, um, pedagogical skill that built a culture, that pulled in those teachers um, that believe fundamentally every child deserves a quality education, and to begin to develop that. Um, and I consistently talk to colleagues about how we have to push ourselves to be better. We have a responsibility and an obligation to children, and there is an urgency to the work that we do. Um, and we need to come together as communities of learners to provide that for our students. And I think it starts with the leadership on a campus and setting expectations that are fair, um, but also having systems of accountability. I certainly know that as a teacher, I'm accountable for every child that enters my classroom. And to make sure that when they leave my classroom, they have learned more more than when they entered earlier that day. Uh, and so I feel that sense of accountability, but I also know that I'm doing it within a culture and within a community that values my opinion, that values my expertise, and that works with me. And so it's creating those cultures in that community on campuses, and I think that leadership has a vital role to play in that. And Kelly, I just wanted to jump in there. It's not that you feel your own responsibility for that child within your class. You collectively Absolutely. hold the responsibility of growing that student across all their classes. And that's what, Andrew, you had shared with me earlier in a conversation about that collective um, responsibility for the entire well-being. And the only way you get to that is when you're collaborating effectively on the whole child development. So, Jeanette, if I can just make one really quick comment, because I think we're running out of time. We are. Um, We've had a lot of uh, analogy issues today with medical, and I just want to tell you, I just finished a tour of all of our schools around the country, and that's exactly what we are now referring to is the medical model for teacher effectiveness. In other words, we're going to evaluate them on the accuracy of the diagnosis. In other words, how well do they identify what's wrong? then how prompt is the treatment? And we have a whole set of sort of prescribed treatments, but it also applies the teacher's own perspective and enthusiasm and so on. Then we'll start looking at the outcomes. So in other words, instead of immediately focusing on the outcomes, we're actually focusing on Good. the diagnosis the and the treatment. The we will then begin to become more informed, frankly, about what the appropriate treatments are so that I think we're starting at the wrong place in how we're doing this analysis. And, and uh, we have been so effective in getting teachers, I think, to understand this by using exactly this medical terminology as opposed to the way in which we most normally now are talking about performance and standardized test scores and so on. Thank you. And on that note, we're gonna conclude our panel. Thank you very much for your attention and a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs>